good evening. I wish everybody in here was as happy as my wife. She's holding a baby. And so I've not got to hold her yet. I have touched her twice, but I hadn't got to hold her. And I tell people that's not a big thing. You know, you go to the hospital and, oh, look at the baby. I got to hold the baby. That's not me. You know, wait till about eight, nine years of age. And, uh, but uh, happy, happy, happy. Good to see you tonight. I'm glad that you're here. I hope you enjoyed Solomon. Uh, Solomon uh, did not, uh, we did not do some things that I wish that we uh, could have and, and uh, had time to do. And one of those things is to show you some pictures. In 19, in, it's 19, in 20, uh, I think 2019, 2018, uh, I was over there, and they wanted me to go to Matru. And I had never been to Matru. Uh, it was a unique experience. Uh, I enjoyed it very, very much in seeing that village and, uh, and seeing the children. And uh, there must have been, they must have been 200, uh, maybe 250 children that were gathered together in a civic building, and they were singing to high heavens and just wonderful things. Now, Brother David Arnold is uh, the founder of World Evangelistic Outreach. And um, he had gone to Matru and he had told them he wanted to build an orphanage there. But it had been, that had been put on the side lines for about five or six years. And so he said, we want to go to Matru and uh, we want to see, and I'm, I want to talk with those people once again about the orphanage. And so we, we did, we went over, and he said, there's property that's been given to us but uh, we have to check with the district chief. Now, all the property belongs to the district chief. Uh, I bought that. Tom, Tom Renane gave money uh, to help in uh, a, a village in Sindabune, and uh, that village, uh, we went over and we purchased the property uh, a, a pro about approximately three acres, and uh, that property's been cleaned. They have a church building that's been built on it. It is a temporary building, and they're hoping to be able to, to um, build a permanent structure. Uh, the temporary buildings take a lot of uh, abuse because of the weather. And uh, last year, they had some flooding, and you just have to see the streets and, the, and water pouring out of the windows of the houses. Some of you understand what it's like to have those floods like that. And uh, so these adobe, these uh, um, mud buildings will not sustain anything like that. And uh, so they, they build the sticks and then they pack it full of mud and uh, then they take and plaster the inside and out and they paint it. And uh, so it, it, it lasts a little bit, but uh, it's not a permanent structure. And so that's what we've got there in Sindibune. And that is fully uh, Muslim. I, I, I had the privilege of being able to preach the gospel there. And the chief told me that's the first time that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed publicly. And Richard uh, King is the pastor, and he had been going into that village and uh, witnessing and things. But we had 70, I think, 73 salvation decisions that were made. And uh, that Sunday we had our first quote unquote church meeting and there was 78 folks there from the village for the church first, the first church meeting. Really a blessing, really a blessing. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. But um, why I'm telling you all that, I don't know. Uh, the, the property belongs to the, the district chiefs. And so even though we buy it and uh, it belongs to us and it's been transferred and the title and everything, it still belongs to the chief. And uh, so when we were there in um, this, this village where Brother Arnold had promised that he was going to build an orphanage, uh, we went to see the district chief. And uh, that was an experience in itself. You'd have to, have to meet some of these chiefs and, uh, and understand who they are and how they operate. But anyway, uh, there was a ministry there, and the man had gone home to be with the Lord. And he said, I want to give uh, World Evangelistic Outreach this property, 50 acres. And it had five buildings on it. These buildings were concrete buildings with wood roofs. And uh, back in the early 2000s, the rebels came through 
Solomon said that Sierra Leone is a safe country. <laughs> and uh, it is. I've never con been concerned about my safety over there. Uh, but um, the rebels came through. They, they burned buildings. It, it, was, it, it was a very bad time for Sierra Leone. Cut the hands and feet off of people and children. Uh, and uh, that's one of the ways in which they marked their march through the villages. This was the blood war, the diamond war. Um, and Solomon experienced that as a, as a 20 year old and can tell you some very awful stories. But um, they burnt these buildings. And so the buildings are standing there, concrete buildings. And, uh, but they had been burned and they had been left for uh, about 18 years. And uh, so a lot of stuff growing up through them. And we went over there with the chief and the chief said, no, you can't have 50 acres. He said, I got to have this because this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do this here. And so I'm going to take this property here, but you can have this property. And it's probably about 30 acres. So he took less than half of it for some things that he was doing for the, for the village. And uh, he said, now I'll give you that, it is yours, but you must start. You've been talking about this for 10 years and you've not done anything. And so you must start. And uh, so uh, there's a couple in Pittsburgh that have retired from their work and have given themselves to help uh, there in Sierra Leone. Their names are Shearers. And I appreciate Mike and Cynthia Shearer. And so Mike said, I want to see that one of those buildings is prepared for these orphans. And uh, so they raised money and they got that fixed. So the, Solomon had been talking to me, long story, but Solomon had been talking to me about the Cynthia Shearer uh, Orphanage, the children's home. And uh, I, oh, this is good, this is good, this is good. I was looking at pictures of it. And I said, this is nice. I mean, very nice. The building looks sharp, really good. Uh, we purchased or helped purchase some uh, bunk beds, metal bunk beds and mattresses to go in there. There'll be 38 children that will be moving over to one of those buildings uh, in the middle of December. And I said, this is good. This is good. And so uh, Solomon and I were working on some pictures and things. And I said, now, where is uh, the Shearer's children home? And, and when he told me, I said, that's, that's what they did to that building? He said, yeah, I, wow, this is fantastic. And uh, spending about $25,000, $30,000 to take the building has to be cleaned up. There's foundational problems, and it has to be uh, reworked, doors, windows put in it, plaster on the inside and the outside, roofs that's got to be put on them. And so it cost about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 per building. But, uh, they have done the, the largest of the buildings, and it's just it's fantastic. And I was just so pleased with that. And Solomon said that that's what he wants to do. He wants to be able to go back to um, Sierra Leone, and he wants to be able to say uh, that uh, there's some churches that are going to help with renovating these other buildings and get these buildings ready. And then the second thing is the Bible college. Uh, he is working diligently in a Bible college. We've got about 80 students that are in the Bible college already. Uh, they've graduated students over the past several years because this is something that's been uh, taking place, but it's been happening inside of a church. But what they want to do is they want to build a university. And uh, they want to be able to have um, doctors and, and uh, nurses and accountants and uh, graduate folks like that, but that have Bible training also. And uh, there's a, a gentleman who is wanting to do that. He's purchased about 30 acres, and uh, he has been working at uh, getting some buildings prepared. And they have run across uh, some buildings in Texas that are being dismantled. They're big metal buildings, and they're being dismantled. And so uh, they have got that donated to Sierra Leone. They're going to box it up and uh, ship it in containers and things to Africa. And then they're going to rebuild those at, uh, at Mariba Junction, which is uh, really the crossroads of Sierra Leone. And uh, they're going to do that there. It's going to be wonderful once it gets done. 
and uh, it's, it's just going to be a good thing. And so I'm very, very pleased about what's taking place in Sierra Leone. Mar uh, Marcus, Solomon is doing a great job. I want you to understand something. Now, there are people who come to America and say there's not any independent Baptist churches in Sierra Leone. I've heard them stand and say that. I've read their letters. That is not true. That man that stood right here is a Baptist, and he's as much Baptist as you are. Now, what they do, their structure is this. Uh, I told you this morning the name of the churches is WIO, World Evangelistic Outreach Baptist Church, of, and they give the, the villages, the village names. Uh, that we've got 30 WIO churches. And when Solomon says it, it kind of rolls off of his tongue, WIO BC, and, uh, and that's what it is, WIO BC Baptist Church and of Kissy Town. And so uh, we've got 30 churches that is under his auspices. Now there's other Baptist churches and they are have some affiliation, but they're not part of the World Evangelistic Outreach Baptist churches. And the pastors that pastor those churches have to swallow real hard. They're under the direction of Solomon. And uh, this corporation, yeah, yeah. And what Solomon does is Solomon is training men to be pastors. And he will take and say, this is a small church over here. And this church has only got 15 members. It's in a small village. It's out in the district. The man's got to be able to grow chickens and goats and have some type of a small garden. This man, who he has not had... Uh, experience in pastoral work we're going to move him over there and he's going to become pastor of that church and then the pastor of that church who has been there and he's got experience in pastoral he's going to move over here and he's going to take this church which is a little larger Solomon will look at these men and say this man is a great soul winner he is, he is a pioneer type he is a church planner so He's going to go to this village. He's going to plant the church. He's going to build the church for a few years. We're going to take him out, and then we're going to send him someplace else and let him start another church. And uh, so under their direction, any time a pastor has some problems, uh, they deal with them, and they deal with them harshly over there. And, uh, but I appreciate it. I'll give you just a little bit of insight about the ministry and taking a little time that we didn't take this morning. If you have any questions... And if you'd like to go, uh, seriously, you can fly. You fly into Lundy, uh, and they, there's accommodations right there. They're probably three-star accommodations, but uh, you're safe. You're in a compound. Uh, there's air conditioning most of the time, and uh, it's enjoyable right there at the airport. You probably spend an, a day there when you arrive and a day when you uh, get ready to come home. And uh, then you'll go into the interior um, if you go to my, Mariba Town, uh, which is about probably a seven-hour drive, pretty hard drive. But if you go the, to the junction, it's only about four and a half, five hours. And uh, there's a guest house there. It has air conditioning some of the time. Uh, or if you go into Freetown, and uh, Freetown is about a 45-minute boat ride uh, from the airport over to Freetown, and there's places you can stay there. We stay at the Animal Kingdom. And we're able to go out and have breakfast and feed the deer as they come out. And I don't know why, but my finger goes like this the whole time that I'm sitting out there. Uh, but it's uh, it'd be an experience, a bigger experience of a lifetime if you were to desire to go. And you can go and you can help train pastors. You can do seminars. You can go and see the work. You can go and just preach in churches. You can just go and be a part. And uh, But... Um, I pray that God will lay something upon somebody's heart. Let's have a prayer. Father, I thank you again for your goodness. And I've taken these 12, 15 minutes to just talk about Sierra Leone. And uh, I want the folks to understand what's going on. And like I said this morning, some things that Solomon does is not the way I would do it. And some things that I do is not the way that Solomon would do it. But I'm thankful for him. And I ask your blessings. Brother Westberg had the privilege of being able to go over with me 
and we stood and we talked for uh, don't know how many hours every day and uh, taxing, very difficult on our bodies. Uh, it's hard whenever you stand in a place with 110 degrees and there's not any air flowing and no air conditioning and, uh, and, and try to stand and teach for hours upon hours, day after day. Uh, Lord, uh, but that's, it's worth it all. It is worth it all to be able to see, to be able to be a little part, and to be able to touch somebody's heart and life. I thank you for that. Thank you for this church, Lord, that allows me and sends me whenever I go to the mission field. And uh, it stirs my heart. I see some things that uh, I have to really scratch my head because I'm saying that's not the way I was trained. That's not the way I do things. That's not the way I've been taught in America. But yet, Lord, I have uh, found out that we don't need to view the Bible from our standards. Um, they're different. They're different. Persecution in our lives is somebody says a bad word to us or they accuse us of forcing something down their throat. But Father, there uh, in Africa and other parts of the world, persecution is real. The beatings, they take place. Uh, Lord, the death, they take place. The torture, they take place. We need to be understanding about that. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to pray for our missionaries. Help us to be mission-minded. Bless those on our prayer sheets, Father. Encourage hearts and just have your sweet will and way. Thank you for our time together tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You know God's blessed you? Do you believe that? Some of you do. Let's uh, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Let's stand together and let's sing that, okay? Life's billows, you are tempest tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings.
may be seated. Brother Dobbs is going to come sing for us a wonderful song, He Came to Me. The gulf that separated me from Christ my Lord. It was so vast the crossing I could never afford. From where I was to him. It seems so far. I cry, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. He came to me. could not come to where he was he came to me that's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. He came to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and gently drew me to his side. Where today in his sweet love I now abide. He came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died on Calvary. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. Yes, he came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died. Oh, come to where he was he came to me
when I could not come to where he was, he came to me. Another hymn, He Touched Me. Love this, this song. May you stand, lift, lift your voice together. Shackled by a heavy burden Beneath the load of guilt and shame Floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior. Since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it while eternity rolls. All right, sing it out, church. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole thank you, you may be seated God's good. Amen. All the time. He is surely good. Father, I thank you for your sweet touch. And Lord, how that you deal in the hearts and lives of men. Sometimes, Lord, for me, it's in the preaching service. And you really strike a chord in my heart. Sometimes it's while I'm alone and I'm reading the scriptures. Father, sometimes I'm riding down the road and I just stand in amazement of who you are and what you have done in my life. We give you thanksgiving. Father, we praise your name for your goodness. How I pray that you would help us as individuals to be that which you would be honored with, that which you were pleased with, that which you can use for your sake. And then, Father, I ask you that you would... Uh, Take uh, the funds that we give, our tithe and our offerings. Lord, I, I marvel, I marvel at the giving of this ministry. And I ask you that you would please help us, that we would uh, use that money for your sake. We would follow your leadership. So you bless our offering tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you have an offering you'd like to give unto the Lord, you bring it right now and place it in the offering tray.
stand again, if you would. We'll sing one more hymn. Uh, we'll sing All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. The first and the last. First and the last of All That Thrills My Soul. Stay and lift your voice once again. seated. Marcy is going to come sing a song. Good. 
as I began to pray about and plan what we would do this year as far as missions goes, and folks ask me, do you have a missions conference? And I tell them no. Oh, I thought y'all were mission-minded. And I said, well, you know, uh, something that has happened down through the years is I do missions emphasis. And I try to keep something before the church. Normally I plan eight weeks. And, uh, but things work out, and it's just amazing what the Lord does. Next week, uh, the middle of next week, I've got two men that I met in 2003 when I was uh, training uh, Muslim converts in Jordan. And uh, I've not seen Hissam since then. Uh, but uh, Hissam will be here as well as Muyed, and they're going to spend a couple of weeks in Orlando, and I'm excited about that. Uh, they'll not be preaching for us, but you'll get to meet them. And uh, they're doing work among the Arabic. Uh, both of these men were part of uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, military and uh, the Republic Guard. And uh, they, were, uh, they were adamant. Uh, Muslims and uh, did all the things and probably uh, Hissam more than uh, Muyed committed to Islam uh, and willing to die for Islam enough said about that but they got saved and what a wonderful thing it's happened in their lives and I'm, I'm thankful for that but I try to keep some things before you and uh, as I was planning some things I wanted you uh, not only to know that we're doing things abroad, but we're doing things local. And I appreciate uh, what Lars and uh, Phyllis Westberg do for us, and a lot of things that you don't know about that they are very involved in, and I appreciate them. And so I've asked Lars if he'd preach for us tonight. So, Brother Lars, whatever you're going to do, now's your time. I need your prayers tonight that I'd be able to make it through this message. I consider it an honor and a privilege to stand behind this pulpit. And several weeks ago, pastor approached me and handed me a little post-it note. I'd like to read it for you this evening. Very simple note. It said the following. Will you be in town? And could you preach at TBC November 21st p.m. The Sunday night before Thanksgiving. And I believe that's his initials at the end of the note. And when I received that note, I immediately responded, Yes, I'll be in town, and yes, I would be privileged to preach in the evening service on November 21st. So from that moment to this, I've been fervently praying about what God wanted me to share in the service. I noticed something recently about the pulpit of Tabernacle Baptist Church. In the last three months, we have had a number of visiting preachers. I wrote their names down. We have had the privilege from September, October, and November to hear Tony Ledbetter, John Nelms, Johnny Daniels, Marcus, Marcus Seacrest, Tom Patterson, Arlo Elam, Matt Swakowski, and this morning Solomon Gorby, and also on several occasions we've heard Steve Ware preach. And so I approached Pastor Ware Wednesday evening to say, 
am I still on schedule for Sunday night? And I approached him in the hallway because I realized a lot of things have happened in his life and the ministry of this church in the last three months. And he informed me about the fact that, well, I realize a lot of things have happened, but so I asked him point blank, do you still want me to preach Sunday night? He says, yes. That gave me the green light to share the message I've been preparing for several months. Now, pastor doesn't realize this, but I listen to his messages. <laughs> and I also take notes on the messages that I hear preachers preach. Somebody asked me one time, why do you do that? Well, first of all, it helps me to concentrate on what's being preached. Secondly, it also helps to keep me awake. It's awfully hard to sleep through a message when you're writing notes down about what the preacher's preaching about. And Wednesday night, he preached on a very interesting subject. He preached on the book of Philemon. And I'm sitting back there in my pew, and I about had a spell. He was preaching from the book of Philemon, a little one chapter book in the New Testament. And he began by describing the reason why the book was written. The author is, of course, the Apostle Paul. Now, some of the letters that Paul wrote under inspiration were church letters. He wrote them to individual congregations, and they were written to the entire church body. However, there were several personal letters that Paul wrote. They're directed to certain special people. For example, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy were not written by Timothy, they were written to Timothy. So as he began to share about Philippians uh, excuse me, Philemon. The three points of the message were, first of all, it is a personal letter. Isn't it? And so, forgive me, Pastor. Whenever I hear another preacher preach, sometimes God puts a thought in my mind, and i got to write it down. Because if I don't, I'll forget it. I have good intentions. Oh, when I get home, I'll write that down, and I say, what was I supposed to write down on a piece of paper? But when he said it's a personal letter, the first words out of his mouth, he was a convert of the Apostle Paul. He mentioned several things about him. He was a believer. He was a blessing to Paul. He was a giver and an encourager. And I said, amen, that's good. But then I started to look at the book of Philemon, and I started to pay attention to the verses in that chapter. There are 25 verses in the book of Philemon, and I started to try to identify all the personal pronouns that are found in that little book. The second statement that he made on Wednesday night was, it's also a prison letter. This letter was written to Philemon while Paul was in prison. There are several prison epistles that are mentioned in the New Testament. And finally, the point that he made was it's a payment letter. It's a personal letter, a prison letter, and a payment letter. Did I get it right? Good, great. I don't want to misquote him by saying he said something he didn't say. But during the course of his message, I was doing something I probably shouldn't have done. I'm reading through the book of Philemon. You know what I found out? It's loaded with personal pronouns. There are 15 different personal pronouns in the book of Philemon. Now I'm a numbers kind of guy. Not only are there 15 different personal pronouns found in that little one-chapter book, I totaled 
the total number of pronouns found throughout the entire chapter. I couldn't believe it. There are 80 total personal pronouns in the book of Philemon. That means that several of the pronouns are repeated over and over and over again. And the third amazement that I got was after the service was over, I was sitting there counting those, and I noticed this. Every single verse in the book of Philemon contains at least one personal pronoun. That's amazing. Now it brings me to the message. November is a special month for me. There are several reasons for making that statement. Number one, November was the month of my parents' wedding anniversary. They were married on November the 4th. Also, the month of November is special to me because it's the date of my mom's birthday. She was born on November the 13th. And had my mom not been born on November the 13th, I wouldn't be here. Some of you will catch that later. Also, it's special to me because it's the month of my physical birthday. I was born into this world on November the 11th, 1946. It's also special to me because our second oldest granddaughter was also born in the month of November. And our youngest granddaughter was born one year ago. Her birthday is coming up. November the 29th, our precious granddaughter Katie was born into the world. And those are family blessings. However, November is also special to me because it's the month of Thanksgiving. Every November, we set aside one day to celebrate a day to give thanks to God. Well, my final statements are the reason why November is super special to me. I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior on November the 8th of 1959. That changed my life forever. So I just recently celebrated my 62nd spiritual birthday. And also finally, it's special to me spiritually because it was on November the 3rd of 1968 that God called me to preach while reading his word. So every November that comes around, I have reason to be thankful. Not only because of family blessings or physical blessings, but most of all for spiritual blessings. I've been doing some reminiscing recently because 10 days ago I celebrated my 75th birthday. Now I realize I don't look that old, but I am. The calendar says otherwise. So in the process of doing some reminiscing and reflecting and remembering, I tried to think back to the people in my spiritual life that have had an influence, who have made an impression, or have had some form of physical impact upon my spiritual life. And I have a lot of people that I could look back to since the moment I got saved on that November night. And I started thinking about people. I wasn't born in a Christian family. My parents never took me to church. We did not read the Bible in our home. We didn't pray together. Now, I wouldn't call my parents heathen, but they were simply good moral people. They tried to bring me up right. I don't know whether they succeeded or failed, but I'll let you choose to decide what you think they did. 
But in thinking back over my entire Christian life, which spans 62 years of salvation, I started to attend a little church in the town where I grew up in Colmer Manor, Maryland. You'd never heard of the town before? If you ever drove through that area of the state of Maryland, you'd probably drive right through it. I think there were maybe 1,300 people in our town, very small town. I started going to a church in that town when I was maybe eight years old. And I hadn't been to church before, so I didn't know what to expect. So one morning I got up and went to church. It was about five blocks from my home. And with my parents' permission, I said, I have to go to church today. So they said, OK, go ahead and go. Just come back home when you're done. So I made my way to that little church building down in the corner of 42nd and Newton Street. And I walked inside the building, and all of a sudden I looked around. There were people inside that building. And I started thinking, what's going to happen today? And the first thing I noticed, there were people in that church building that were carrying Bibles. And I thought, is that what church is all about? I mean, do you come to church to carry your Bible? And I found out this. They were bringing their Bibles because there was somebody that was going to preach the Bible from a pulpit. Never having been in church before, I didn't know what, what's going on. So I started looking around at those people. You know what they, they seemed to me? They were happy. They were happy to be at church. And I thought, what's happy about being in church? What's going on here? Why are all these people here in this church building bringing their Bibles into the church? And pretty soon I found out what they were doing. A little short man walked up behind the pulpit. He could barely see over the pulpit. I found out quite quickly he's the pastor of the church. He's getting ready to preach a message. And I thought, boy, this is strange. For the next 45 minutes, maybe he preached a message from the Bible. Then he had a word of prayer, extended an invitation to people in the service that needed to make a decision, had a word of prayer, and we went home. And I looked around and I thought, is this all there is to it? But I noticed something very quickly about that, those people in that church. They were strange. Let me go a step further. They were peculiar. They were different. They were unique. And may I say something in love? They were weird. You say, what made them different? I was about to find out. And the longer I went to that church, the more I began to recognize certain people that were there every time the church doors were open. And this strange church with weird people, peculiar, unusual people, didn't get enough religion on Sunday morning, so they decided they were going to come back on Sunday night. And I said, that's radical. But I decided out of curiosity to go to an evening service just to find out what those people do in an evening service. Found out quite quickly that it essentially the same thing that it did in the morning, except in the evening service, they had more opportunities for people to share something that was happening in their lives. So we would sing songs from a hymnal. We would uh, receive an offering. Now, you talk about an experience that you're not accustomed to. I saw the men that walked down the aisle. They were, they were called ushers. And they had things in their hand called an offering plate. And after they had a word of prayer, they started to pass those plates down the row. And I thought, man, this is great. I started to take something out of the offering plate. And somebody stopped me. No, 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 you don't understand. You're supposed to put something in the offering, not take something out of it. And I go, really? I didn't know any better. We sang several songs, received an offering. They made some announcements, and finally... The preacher got up and preached. 
But before he preached, he said, does anybody have a testimony tonight they'd like to share? And I go, what in the world is that? Several people stood up and said, I praise God for answering prayer. I praise God for meeting my needs. I praise God for doing this or that or the other thing in my life. And I sat there and thought, God's not doing anything in my life. How come these people are so excited about God? They're weird. They're strange. They're different, peculiar, and unusual. I want to read a little statement to you that I came across from Reader's Digest. It said this, try to name the five wealthiest people in the world. Could you do that? Can you name the last five winners of the Miss America competition? Can you name five people who have won the Nobel or Pulitzer Prize? Now, name three friends who have helped you through a difficult time in your life. Name three people who have taught you something worthwhile. Think of a few people who have made you feel appreciated and special. The people you'll never forget are not the ones with the most credentials, the most money, or the most awards. The people who will make a difference in your life are the ones who care and they will live forever. So this past week, I made a list of the three most influential people in my spiritual life. Why did I do that? I could have put a lot of people's names on that list. But I was challenged to think about who they were, what they did to be included on the list, how they did it, and why they did it. I had a bunch of names to choose from. I could have chosen any of the pastors whose ministries I had been under during my life. And I came up with the names of three people. Now, you don't know any of these people but I know them quite well. I chose to include these three names on my list of people that have influenced my life spiritually since I got saved. One person on my list is Pastor Vaughn Sprunger. He was the pastor of Community Baptist Church in South Bend, Indiana. My wife and I were married in June of 1970, and we candidated for a position as youth pastor of that church on our honeymoon. Let me give you a word of explanation. I'm so glad that church voted to call me as a youth pastor. Otherwise, Phyllis and I would still be on our honeymoon. <laughs> Believe that if you want to, but it ain't true. The reason why I have included him on my list is he was my spiritual mentor. Newly married, newly graduated from college, newly ordained, but I didn't know anything about the ministry. And this man was determined that he did not call an assistant pastor to be an errand boy. He didn't have somebody come on staff so that they do jobs he didn't want to do. His ministry as senior pastor of that church was to mentor men in the ministry. I met with him quite frequently. He was a great help to me in the early days of my pastoral ministry. He took time to explain things to me. He took time to show me things he had learned in his experience that would help me be effective in my life in ministry. The second person on my list is someone who has preached from this pulpit. His name is Garvin Walls. 
Garvin Walls is now the pastor of Mount Pisgah Baptist Church in Tennessee. Back in 1976, the principal of the Christian school where he was pastor had announced he was resigning from the principal position. He was going back to Bible college. So that necessitated them trying to find a principal to fill his location. And my wife's mom and dad attended that church that he was pastoring, Briscoe Run Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. So he contacted me and said, Brother Westberg, we understand that you might be available and be able to come as a principal of a Christian school and assistant pastor in the church. And I said, I'm not interested. You know why? I had driven through West Virginia before. And you may not believe this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. One time I'm driving through West Virginia. If you want to exercise in patience, you better learn how to drive in West Virginia. Right, Brother Marcus? And we're driving through that state. I mean, mountainous roads going every which way, hairpin curves, and slow speed limits. And I'm in a hurry to get where I'm going. So we went from our home in South Bend, Indiana, and on vacation, where do you go? You go to visit family because you can't afford to go anywhere else. So at that time, my wife's parents lived in Parkersburg, West Virginia. So we made a trip from there. We left in South Bend, drove down to Parkersburg, and got there in one day. And in the course of our travels, we had to realize that we had to go through several states. And we arrived there in West Virginia, spent several days with my mom's parents, and then we made a decision to go visit my mom and dad, who at that time lived in Maryland, where I grew up. So, spent the several days in my wife's parents' family, spent some time together with them, and then all of a sudden she said, well, it's time to go to Maryland. And I said, which way do we go? She said, there's only one way to go. Route 50. And I went, Route 50, so what? She says, I learned to drive in West Virginia. I said, well, that's good. And then I found out what she was talking about. Did fine till we left Parkersburg, started to go down Route 50 to the east, heading toward the Washington, D.C. area. I started to notice something. These roads are getting windy and curvy and steep, and they don't have a very high speed limit. I remember seeing a sign on the side of the road that said, Danger! Hairpin turn ahead. And I said, what's a hairpin turn? Didn't take me long to figure it out. I'm coming to that speed limit sign that says 50, no, excuse me, 30 miles an hour. And I said, 30 miles an hour? I've never been on a road had to go 30 miles an hour in my life. And all of a sudden, I made that hairpin turn. My brakes are applied. I'm screeching and squealing my tires. And I said, that speed limit is too high. It better be 15 miles an hour. It took us hours to get from Parkersburg to Maryland. Spent several days with my parents, spent several days with family, and then it's time to retrace our steps. I turned to my wife and I said, is there any other way we can go? She said, nope, Route 50 again. I'll never forget it. Driving back on that occasion, we stopped midway at a place called Mount Storm. It was a mountain. And we parked there to get something to eat, to take a restroom break. And then I got back in the car and I said, how much further is it? She says, we're about halfway. And I made this statement, I'll never forget it, and she's never let me forget it. I told her that day, I know one thing, God would never call me to go to a place called West Virginia. With a gleam in her eye and a poked finger in my face, she said this, you better never tell God where you're not going to go. You better never tell God or you're not going to go. Finally, after wrestling with God, I surrendered to become the associate pastor and principal of Briscoe Run Christian Academy. 
Now, why did I include garb and walls on my list? Vaughn Sprunger was my mentor. But garb and walls taught me how to love people. He taught me how to love people. He taught me how to love strange people. He taught me how to love peculiar people. He taught me how to love different people. That man had a heart for God, but he also had a heart for people. The two first names on my list I included for a reason. For the balance of the message tonight, I want to share about the one individual that I believe has had the most dramatic influence in my Christian life since the day I got saved. There's a verse I want to quote to you tonight. It's found in John chapter 1 and verse number 6. This verse says very simply, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. You say, so what? There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. Now, I looked that phrase up in the Bible. There was a man. If you took time to read the entire Bible, you would find that on 15 separate occasions, that phrase is mentioned. There was a man. 15 times. So I went one step further. The 15 times that phrase appears in the Bible, on eight occasions, it's followed by the following statement. Whose name was? Whose name was? And the other seven occasions, there was a man named and their name appears. So what am I trying to tell you? There are people throughout the Bible who are mentioned by name. And before I go any further, every one of us is different. Aren't you thankful for that? Can you imagine if everybody in the world was like me? Wouldn't that be a frightening thought? Wouldn't it? But something more amazing to me, suppose everybody in the world was just like you. That's an even scarier thought. When God all made each one of us, he made us unique. There is nobody that has ever lived upon planet Earth that is like you are. We're all different, folks. We're different on purpose. That's God's design for us. He never made two people the same. Therefore, all of us are strange, peculiar, different, unique, and weird. But God can use anybody, even you and even me. Now, we're going to look at this man just a few moments tonight. Before I do so, I want to remind you of something we all have in common. Are you ready? These following statements apply to absolutely every person in the world. Number one. Every person in the world is either an unbeliever or a believer. 
Think about it. There's only two possibilities. Every person in the world right now, and there are approximately 7.9 billion people alive on planet Earth at this moment. Every one of those 7.9 billion people presently living on the earth, every person in the entire world is either an unbeliever or a believer. Secondly, they are either lost or they're saved. They are either unforgiven or they are forgiven. Are you with me? Every person in the world is also either a mission field or a missionary. There's no middle ground. Also, listen carefully, Every person in the world will spend eternity either in hell or in heaven. Do you really believe that, Brother Westbrook? I sure do. Because that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Also, every person in the world is either a child of the devil or they're a child of God. There is no middle ground. And finally, listen carefully, every person in the world will someday stand before God in judgment. Where will unbelievers appear? at the great white throne judgment recorded in the book of Revelation. However, what about those who are believers? They're saved. Their sins are forgiven. When they die, they're going to heaven. And where will they appear before God in judgment? At the judgment seat of Christ. Now, why did I make the statement? Because I want to mention to you tonight why I included Gordon Crockett as the most influential person in my entire Christian life. Let me tell you something about Gordon Crockett. Gordon Crockett had been saved from a very difficult life. He had done many things in his life that he was ashamed of. And some of the things that he had done probably should cause him to be put in prison. But one day somebody came to Gordon Crockett and said, Gordon, can I tell you something? God loves you. And his first reaction was, get out of here. Leave me alone. Don't bother me with that religious stuff. But the more that friend spoke to him, the more the Spirit of God began to convict Gordon's heart. So this friend of his, he gave the testimony that this friend kept talking to him and was talking to him. He said, hey, Gordon, you need to accept Christ as your Savior. You need to get your sins forgiven. You need to get ready to go to heaven when you die. And Gordon kept putting it off, putting it off. So finally, Gordon agreed to talk to this man. And he sat down, and the man showed him from the Bible that he was a sinner, that he deserved God's judgment. The penalty for sin is death. And for some strange reason, Gordon listened to him. And as Gordon listened to the message of salvation, he thought, that's what I need. So there, the man said, would you like to invite Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior? Right here and right now. And Gordon said, I want to do that. That night, Gordon Crockett was transformed. It was one of those life-changing salvations that people read about and talk about and hear about, but very few ever experience. 
He came from the depths of sin to the heights of glory. And what I'm going to share with you tonight is the reason why this man was so influential in my life. Now, first of all, he was not a clergyman. He was a layman. Gordon's occupation was a barber. He owned a barber shop. And after Gordon got saved, he realized something. God expected him to be a witness to everyone. And one day, I had been going to a barber shop in my town that was a lot closer, but I was watching this man. And I thought, this guy's strange. I mean, you talk about weird and different and unusual. I mean, I had never seen anybody like this guy in my life. Remember, I'm going to this church with a lot of other weird people, but he stood out for some reason. So I found out he was a barber. So one day I, I thought, I need a haircut, so I'm going to go to Bo Gordon's barber shop instead of the one I was used to going to. So I made my way into the barber shop, and I expected to go to a typical barber shop, man's barber shop. However, when I got there, I realized it was not at all as I expected. I looked around the barber shop, and the first thing I noticed, he had some framed Bible verses on the wall. And I thought, okay, this isn't a church, this is a barber shop. And then I noticed that instead of having girly pictures hanging with a calendar on the wall, I noticed that he had the Bible verses, and I looked around for reading material. You know what I found? I didn't find any secular magazines, no secular newspapers. Everything I saw on the table there for men to read while they were waiting to get a haircut were gospel booklets, magazines, newspapers that told about Jesus Christ and salvation. He had entirely gospel literature. He had a stack of gospel tracts there sitting on the table. I noticed also in his barber shop he had Christian music playing in the background. And I thought, this is really strange. I've never been in a barber shop like this in all my life. But then I realized what Gordon Crockett was doing. He had determined before God that he was going to make his barber shop his mission field. It was fascinating to go there for the first time. I sat in my place there along with the other men in the barber shop. And here's what Gordon Crockett did to absolutely every man that came into his barber shop. Now, we're sitting there in chairs. The only material we can look at and read is gospel literature, magazines, newspaper, tracts. And when it was time for you to get in the barber chair, he would have you, uh, you're next, come up to the chair, and you'd sit in the chair, they put that wrap around you, and the first question they ask you is, how do you want your hair cut? So the first time you go to his barber shop, you realize something. I'm surrounded by the gospel. This man must be a religious man. And what Gordon Crockett did to me was absolutely fascinating. He controlled the conversation. You say, what do you mean, Brother Westberg? Now, I've been in some barber shops, and what the, most people do in a barber shop is talk about everything under the sun. They talk about current events. The men talk about politics, sports, weather, hunting, and religion. And somebody starts making a comment, and somebody else chimes in and says, well, I was talking about that, and I think this and that and the other thing. So what? So what would you think? And as soon as that man, for the first time coming to Gordon's barbershop, sat in the chair, told how he wanted his hair cut, you know what Gordon did? He controlled the conversation. The first thing that Gordon would do would say, 
Let me tell you about the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in my life. And Gordon Crockett sat with that captive individual in a barber chair to get a haircut, and he shared his personal testimony of salvation. You know what's happening? All the other men in the barber shop waiting to get their hair cut are listening. When he got done, he said, thank you very much. They paid him for the haircut and walked out of the shop. Now, if you came back to his barber shop, the second time you came back, he said, now, I remember the last time you were here and I told you my testimony of salvation. He said, let me tell you what the Bible says about how you can have eternal life. He proceeded to share the gospel. He went down the Roman road. He said, do you know that you're a sinner? Did you know the Bible teaches that you're deserving of death, eternal separation from God? And that guy's sitting there, what can he do? Get up out of the chair and walk out? No, he has to get his hair cut. So the second visit to the barber shop was sharing the gospel. Every person that came into his barber shop heard his testimony of salvation on the first visit. The second visit, he heard the plan of salvation. And the third time they came back, he said, can I share with you today how by faith you can know Jesus Christ as personal Savior be certain if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven. What was Gordon Crockett doing? What we as believers all should be doing. We all should be doing that. Gordon Crockett did not preach Christ in a church. He preached Christ in a barbershop. Gordon Crockett did not preach from behind a pulpit. He preached from behind a barber chair. And Gordon Crockett did not preach to a person in a church pew. His audience was a man in a barber chair to get a haircut. And one of the most effective means he used at the end of his sharing his testimony, sharing the gospel, and encouraging that man in the barber chair to receive Christ was this. Now the men that are here tonight that are a little bit older can remember the time when we used to get a haircut. The barber would cut our hair with the trimmers and the scissors and comb it out and he says, does that look all right? Is it thin enough? Is it tapered enough on the side? But then the final thing that he always did was go walk over to the soap machine, the soap dispenser, and they had a lather dispenser there where he would take and put his hand under it. He'd get a, a gob of a soap and put it around your ear and on your neck because he's getting ready to give you a shave. And I remember like it was yesterday, there's dear old Gordon Crockett, He's already applied the soap to the ears and the neck of the person he's getting ready to shave, and he had a straight razor. There was a razor strop attached to the barber chair. So Gordon Crockett would walk over to that razor strop and begin to sharpen his straight edge razor. Now imagine what he did next. While he's sharpening that razor to a razor sharpness to be able to cut that man's ears and sideburns, he would say this, do you know for sure if you died right now that you would go to heaven? I'll tell you one thing, if I was sitting in that barber chair and the barber's holding a straight, a straight razor that he's getting ready to apply to my face, I'd be very quick to say, I sure would like to know that. The first thing I want you to notice about Gordon Crockett was he preached. Not in a church building, but a barbershop. Not behind a pulpit, but behind a barber chair. 
And he wasn't preaching to a person in a church pew. He was preaching to a man that was seated in his barbershop. Gordon Crockett took seriously his responsibility of preaching the gospel. The second thing I want to mention tonight about Gordon Crockett was this. Gordon Crockett prayed. He prayed. You say, well, <laughs> I'm a believer and I pray. In this strange, weird, unusual church I'm telling you about where I got saved, they not only had Sunday school, morning service, evening service, this church actually had a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And I thought, this is unheard of. Can't these people get enough religion on Sunday? They got to come back on Wednesday? When I got saved, I started to go to that church. I said, I got to find out what these people are all about. So I went to the prayer meeting that night, and that was exactly what it was, a prayer meeting. God's people got together, and they prayed. And I thought, is this all there is to it? But I was learning something. I'm a believer now. I've accepted Christ as my Savior. My sins are forgiven. I'm going to heaven when I die. And what should I be doing? Well, I ought to be witnessing. I ought to be telling other people about my salvation. But I ought to be praying. So, believe it or not, every Wednesday night, we came to church, and Gordon Crockett had a prayer list. A prayer list. Yeah. He had the names of people on his list. Now, this is long before Craig's list or Angie's list. We had Gordon's list. And we knew exactly what to expect on Wednesday night. Gordon Crockett would read from that list, and on that list were three categories. The first column was a list of the men he had personally shared his testimony with that week in his barbershop. The second column was those he had given the gospel to that week, but as yet they had not accepted Christ as their Savior. And the third column was a list of those individuals who had accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior right there in the barber chair in the barbershop. He had a long list. He learned that person's name, determined to share the gospel with them while they were in the barbershop, and he prayed fervently that they would make the most important decision of their lives. What did I learn by the experience? That Gordon Crockett not only preached, but he also prayed. It was amazing to me, as I heard him recite that list of names, how many individuals Gordon Crockett had personally led to Jesus Christ. And I started to realize something. Why am I not doing that? Why am I not doing that? I could be, and I should be, but nobody ever showed me how to do it. The final point I want to make tonight about Gordon Crockett. Gordon Crockett not only preached, he also prayed, but thirdly, he praised God. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in some churches where people are vocal about their praise to God. Nothing wrong with that. If you choose to do it, that's fine. But I wasn't accustomed to having public people say, Amen! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Glory to God! And I started looking around and I go, Whoa, whoa, what's happening here? You know one of the ones who was most vocal in that church? was Gordon Crockett. He had so much to praise God for. He didn't look at it as a job or an occupation, a way to make money to provide for his family. He looked at it as a mission field that he could have every single day of his life. And when I saw Gordon Crockett 
when something was said during a church service that really blessed his heart, he would very vocally say, Amen! And I thought, well, it's okay. And something really blessed him, he would say, Praise the Lord! And people didn't look at him in a strange way. I mean, it was natural and normal for him. He had so much to thank God for. But one day I'm sitting in the church service, and when something really blessed Gordon's heart, instead of saying amen or praise the Lord, he'd raise his hand up and say, 150! 150! Now, I thought he was advertising the price of his haircuts. Back in my day, you'd get a haircut for a dollar and a half. So one day, a curiosity got the best of me, so I walked up to Gordon and I said, Gordon, I notice when something is said that really blesses your heart, you say, Amen, or praise the Lord. I said, once in a while you say 150. What's that all about? He said, do you have your Bible with you? I said, yes. He said, turn to Psalm 150. So I turned my Bible to Psalm 150. He said, read that chapter, six verses. When I got done reading it, he looked at me and he says, what does that chapter talk about? I said, well, it talks about praising God quite often. He says, 13 times to be exact. Psalm 150, verses 1 through 6, 13 times in that one chapter, the word praise is mentioned. So when something really blesses me, I don't always say, amen, praise the Lord, but I say, 150! I'm praising the Lord 13 times. What an attitude. What an attitude. Now, I ask you to bear with me tonight for a few months longer. I'm about to do something tonight that I have never done in my 51 years of ministry. And I prayed fervently about what I'm about to share with you. Not long ago, I was looking at my life. I'm ashamed to confess this to you. But I should have been doing a lot more for God than I'm doing. And tonight I'm going to give a very pointed invitation. It is also going to be a personal invitation. But most importantly of all, I want to give you a practical invitation invitation tonight. I was reminiscing about Gordon the other day, and I thought, I wonder what he's doing in heaven. He had a lot of people that were going to join him in heaven because he decided to become a witness for Jesus Christ. And my thought was, if he can do it, I can do it. So I put together an invitation card tonight. And let me share with you what this card says before we go any further. The title that I have given to this card is an invitation response card. And I had to prayerfully consider what I feel God led me to put on this card. Let me read to you the words that you'll find printed on this card. And I'm going to invite you tonight to make a personal decision. It's a pointed decision but it's also a practical decision. You'll read the following words on this card. Being led by the Holy Spirit, I, and there's a place for you to write your name in that space. Being led by the Holy Spirit, I am making a decision today to make an attempt during the next week 
to do one or more of the following three things. If you choose to respond to this invitation tonight, I invite you to step forward, take one of these cards, put your name on it, and put the nature of the decision you are making tonight at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Now here are the three possibilities I've listed. I am making a decision today to make an attempt during the next week. I did that for a reason. I didn't ask you to come up and fill out a card tonight to make a decision sometime in the future. Many times in a church service I've been challenged to respond to an invitation, but I haven't done it. How long does that decision last till I get out the doors of the building and then I totally forget about what the promise I made to God? Here are the three areas that I'm going to challenge you tonight to consider making a personal decision before God to make an attempt. It doesn't say you're going to be successful, but to make an attempt in the next week to, number one, share my testimony of salvation with another person. Share my testimony of salvation with another person. Number two, give the gospel plan of salvation to an unbeliever. Number three, make an attempt during the next week to seek to lead an individual to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Before I extend that invitation to you tonight, may I remind you of something. Any and all of us in this church auditorium could make a decision tonight to do one or more of those three things. And I promise you tonight, if you'll do it, God will change your life. He really will. It's going to be a pointed invitation. It's specific. It's just not well, I need to start doing better at witnessing. No, it's specific. Share your testimony of salvation with another person. Give the gospel plan of salvation to an unbeliever or seek to lead an individual to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And at the bottom is a place for you to put your signature and today's date. Now, I'm not doing this for my benefit. And what I want you to do, if you do feel led to make the decision tonight that God's prompted you to make, I'm not going to ask you to turn this card into me. It wouldn't do any good anyway. Here's what I want you to do if you choose to respond tonight to the Spirit of God. First of all, Do not put this card in your Bible. What? Don't stick it in your Bible, along with everything else you got there. The prayer cards that you pick with missionaries come through and bulletins that you put in there and never look at. But don't put it in your Bible. Secondly, don't put it in your pocket or purse. Have you ladies ever put something in your purse and couldn't find it? Have you men ever put something in your pocket and couldn't locate it where it was when it got there? Don't put it in your Bible. Don't put it where? In your pocket or purse. And thirdly, don't put it in a drawer somewhere. Well, I'll put it in the drawer at home, stick it in there, and. Go and look at it the rest of the week. Well, that's not going to help you. And finally, please, 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 don't put it in the trash can. Don't put it in the trash can. Don't say, I'll come tonight and fill my card out, and as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to go home and throw it in the trash. It's not going to help you, folks. It's not going to help you. Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do in just a moment. If you do feel led to come tonight and respond to this personal, pointed, and practical invitation, I want you to put this card in a prominent location. You say, what do you mean by a prominent location? 
You might choose it to put on your bathroom mirror. When you first get up in the morning, what's one of the first places you look? In the mirror. And you think, do I really look like that? You got bed head, your hair's all messed up, and you think, I better get ready to go out of the house. You don't go out of the house looking like you did when you first got up, but you look in the mirror to indicate, I better put my makeup on, ladies, right? I better comb my hair, I better brush my teeth, I better get dressed. And you look in the mirror to find out what you look like before you walk out the door of your house. You can put it on your bathroom mirror or you can put it at your desk at work. If you work on a job that requires you to be at a desk, put that card on your desk and look at it frequently throughout the day. You could put it by your computer. You look at a computer, so put it right up there next to the computer so when your computer's on, you're looking at something in a program, look at, oh, oh, I made that promise. Uh, I better think about uh, somebody I can share my testimony with or I better think of somebody I can uh, share the gospel with or uh, maybe I can look for somebody to lead to the Lord today. If you happen to do a lot of driving with your job, put it on the dashboard of your car. Put it on the dashboard of your car. That way you're driving down the road and you look at the traffic ahead of you and say, oh, there's that card. Oh, oh, I, I made a promise to God that this week I'm going to try to share my testimony, give the gospel, and try to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. You might put it beside your television. Uh-oh. How much time do you spend watching television? And how much time do you spend trying to do these three things? As a believer, what are you doing? And finally, I thought of the best place at all to put your card. Are you ready? Keep it with your cell phone. But when you take your cell phone out, also take your card out with it. And you'll be amazed how often you look at this device in the day's time. What should it be? It should prompt you to think about a decision you made tonight that you're determined to make an attempt to share your testimony, give the gospel, and try to lead someone else to Jesus Christ and salvation. It'll convict you, my friend. I guarantee it. And then finally, before you go to bed each night, would you look at your decision card? Before you put your head on your pillow, look at that card to see if you have made an attempt to do what you promised God that you would try to do. That's the message. How will you respond to God? Now the final statement I'm going to make, and I make a lot of final statements, is this. God did not lay this message on my heart tonight by accident. I thought a lot about Gordon Crockett this past week. That was 62 years ago. But I still remember the effect this man's testimony had on my early Christian life. Tonight, I'm not going to give a traditional invitation. Ordinarily, at the end of our church services, we do three things. Stand to your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed, as we give the invitation. Pastor will stand up if you need to make a decision tonight to accept Christ as your Savior, 
get baptized, join the church, make a dedication of your life to God, we encourage you to come forward tonight and let people know that you're making this decision so we can rejoice together with you. Tonight it's not going to be stand up, heads bowed, eyes closed. Tonight it's going to be sit down, heads up, and eyes open. What? You actually expect me to get up out of my pew and walk forward tonight in front of all these people? Yes, I do. And yes, God does. Why should I make my decision public? It'll help to seal the decision you're making tonight by not only writing your name on a card, but making a solemn promise to God that you will make an attempt in the coming week to do one, two, or three things listed on this card. Kelly, would you please come to the piano? Would you please play a song, if you happen to have the words? So send I you. Now some of you may say tonight, I don't like this kind of message. Neither do I. But I had to preach it tonight because that's what God gave me. And I've determined in my life and ministry, I want to be as practical as possible. God's people would do far more than they're already doing if we gave them help in figuring out how to do it. Gordon Crockett is my example. He showed me how to be a witness. By his personal example in a barber shop of all places, he preached to every person that came into his shop. He prayed fervently for every man that sat in his chair that week. And he had the joy and privilege of leading countless souls to Jesus Christ and salvation. When I get to heaven, I'm going to run up to Gordon Crockett and I'm going to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. That you taught a young boy how to live for Jesus by doing one simple thing. Sharing Christ with everyone you meet. Do you feel led to come tonight? It's a piano game begins to play. I'd like to put one of these decision cards in your hand. I encourage you to take one and remain at the front of the auditorium, please, if you would. You remain at the front, please, just for a minute. Thank you. verse tonight? Are you being obedient to the Spirit of God? Are you being obedient to the Spirit of God? I don't have a scorecard I'm figuring out tonight to make a list of how many people responded to this invitation. That's never been my desire as an evangelist. To make a list of, wow, we had a great service tonight. We had 13 people step forward to make a decision. 
That's not what it's all about, folks. It's being personally, actively involved in what all of us, the believers, are supposed to be doing all the time. That's correct. Gordon Crockett taught me that lesson many years ago. I have to confess this to you. I've not always done it. I've not always done it. Let me pray a prayer of dedication. My Heavenly Father, I too remember men who have set examples in my life. And I marvel. I marvel at some men that you've allowed to pass through my life that were witnesses. They had no fear. Lord, I don't think they may have put their name on a card. They understood and they realized that it was a responsibility. They had been bought with a price. Lord, I ask you, this is a wonderful thing, and I ask you that as we dedicate ourselves to you this week to be a witness, to share our testimony, to try to win somebody to thee, that you would give us fruit. Father, I pray that you would help us, that we might be able to praise you. Thank you again for Brother Westberg. Thank you for his dear wife. Thank you for their ministries down through the years as well as their labor and love right here. Lord, I ask you that you'd bless us as we go our separate ways. And Lord, this is Thanksgiving week. People probably are going to be a little bit more receptive this week. And uh, from now through the first of the year, for us to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Talk to